Okay. Um, well, it's a pleasure again, like I said before. I can't stress it enough. It is always a pleasure to be able to come out here and to be with you and to share um, the word with you. And um, this morning I wanted to focus in on um, chapter 3, I mean, verse 3 of chapter 5 of um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, before we get started, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'd if you guys have never had done a self-study on the Sermon on the Mount or never read it through, I really encourage you to do it. Um, you know, it is the longest consecutive sermon that Jesus ever preached. And you've got it all written down right there. And it's the first one that Jesus ever preached. And you got it written down right there. And, it, you know, there's just, there's just this intimate um, uh, glimpse into the heart of God as you read through the Sermon on the Mount. And also you see the priorities that Christ lays out for us. You know, and what would surprise you more, if you can do it, read the whole Sermon on the Mount in one sitting. And then go back through and start studying it verse by verse. Because as you read it all in one sitting, it will amaze you how many phrases Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount you will find coming out of the lips of people in contemporary culture. And you'll just be like, whoa! <laughs> you said that? You know, he's like, do you know who said that? Like, you know, that came from the Bible, right? You know, you will see these things like the golden rule, for instance. That came from the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you will, I remember learning that in kindergarten. It's like, wow, and then I'm a product of the public school system. They taught us the golden rule. Little did I know until I got older, like, well, wow, what? That, Jesus said that. You know, there's so many things that are, th with, that are with, woven throughout the Sermon on the Mount that, you know, they're important. You know, it's just, wow, you see them everywhere. But then also, if you read it in a big hole like that, you will come, you will start to see this tapestry that Jesus wove, that there's an actual sequence. There's an order of what Jesus said when he taught from the Sermon on the Mount. It's not just he jumped up and just started giving out all these religious platitudes, just kind of, you know, shotgun approach, like going, oh yeah, meekness, bam, all right, yeah, and over here, a hunger, yeah. And, you know, it's just, he, there's a progress, a spiritual progression through all of these things. And it's not, it's not that um, a mistake that it begins the way it begins. You know, he starts off with the Beatitudes. And the reason why we have these Beatitudes here is the entire Sermon on the Mount will not make, you know, you can kind of shove it into any sort of random social economic sense of like, oh, well, you know, let's, let's apply this to our culture and Look, now everyone's going to be fine because we're going to be living chapter 6 or we're going to be living... But if you don't have the Beatitudes, you know, that really offsets everything else. Because it's the Beatitudes that brings you, that calls you to a different plane than what, you, than what we live here on earth. And nothing speaks more to that calling than the very first Beatitude that Jesus says. The very first Beatitude that Jesus lays out is the one that is just, it really sets the world apart from the Christian, from the church, is completely opposite. And the very first beatitude is simply this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you kind of sit there and you're like, well, how, you know, how does this apply to, uh, you know, you know, to any sort of sequence? I mean, why is this poor in spirit more important? Or, you know, why is the poor in spirit come before those who mourn, before the gentle, before those who hunger, before those who are merciful, before those who are pure in heart? Why is it important that, the, that, that we start off here at the very beginning with blessed are the poor in spirit? You know, sadly, it hasn't rained really this year. Is anyone else missing the rain as much as me? I, I'm missing the rain tremendously. Um, I haven't even started farming yet. And, and you know what? And now I'm kind of at the point of, I don't think I'm going to. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who are blessed with, you know, 
six or eight feet of beautiful topsoil and stuff like that. I live in kind of a sandy bottom, and my topsoil is about, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, varies. And I see these guys out there disking, and there's this giant cloud of dust behind them. I'm like, go, ah, that's your topsoil! It's like, I can't afford to do that. So I wait until it rains. And once it rains, then I'll start disking. But you know, there's a method to planting hay. You know, when you stop and you think about it, you're like, well, duh. You know, but, you know, but think about it. Do you harvest before you seed, before you plow? No? You know, there's a sequence of events that you need to do. First, you need to plow. Then you seed slash fertilize. Unless you're growing organic. <laughs> then you pray for rain a lot. And then it grows and you harvest. You know, it, those are the three basic steps. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you could be doing in the meantime, but you know, you plow, you seed, you harvest. And that plowing is extremely important. As a matter of fact, if you do a poor job plowing, you're not going to have a very good harvest because plowing is the initial step of preparing that soil, preparing that field. Because in the off season, what's happened to that field after you harvest? Well, if you look around out here, you'll see mustard weed growing about this tall or star thistle or something. You got to knock that stuff down. You got to disc it up. You got to churn it out. You got to make sure that the, that the, that the soil is completely bare ready to receive something new. And this very first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, is about preparing your heart to be filled with the wondrous graces and mercies that God's going to provide. But before we go into that, I want to kind of make a little side note of what, the, what, what being poor in spirit is not. You know, many times throughout the history of the church, because, you know, I, I guess because culturally the church has been blessed with a lot more people who are on the lower end of the spectrum of the financial ladder than the upper. It's been oftentimes conveyed because they'll take, you know, people will take chapter uh, 5, verse 3, and then they'll take Luke chapter 6, which Jesus just simply almost narrates the, um, the Beatitudes and just says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then they go to the to the um, to when Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler, and he and he ended up saying, Well, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. For the church to suddenly conclude and say, Well, what Jesus is saying is it's good to be poor. Blessed are the poor. Like if you're monetarily poor, if you don't have anything, if you don't, if you, if you're, if you're just not doing very well financially, then blessed are you because you're poor. And that there's some sort of intrinsic value, some sort of spiritual value that because you have less money or you know you don't have a lot of possessions, that now suddenly you kind of have this spiritual end. It's like, hey, I'm halfway there because you know what. I'm poor. <laughs> and th that's, this, this, that message has been preached a lot throughout Christianity. It's this focus on like, well, well if you don't have it, then, then, you know, then you're, you're blessed and poor. You know, that doesn't really work at all, actually. Um, and if you really boil that down, you'll find that you're actually more aligning yourself with, this, with like a Buddhist concept as opposed to Christian. Because you see, what happens is that if, if being poor means that you have this special in to spirituality because, you know, you're poor, then what happens if someone gives you a dollar to help alleviate your poorness? They're taking some of that away from you. You're being cheated. You're losing some of that special in you had because they gave you a dollar or they gave or they helped you out with, you know, you know, I, I, you know I, classic example is kids asking their parents for money. 
it never really gets over, as I as I know. You know, I can remember my mom asking my grandma, you know, like, hey, can you give me a couple hundred bucks to help with the mortgage this month? And my grandma, yeah, I'll pay you back, mom. I'm like, no, oh, no, sure, okay. You know, I can't remember that. You know, it's like, just, you know, the finance, the burden just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, <laughs> but um, I, I've got three kids. But, but you know, there's this idea that when you go and you get, you know, when, if, you, if you're giving money to people who are poor, you're cheating them out of, because you're alleviating their poorness, you're cheating them out of that spirituality that they had. That special connection they had is now gone. Because you're less poor. And then also you have to ignore, you know, verses like Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him. Proverbs 22, 9. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. And more importantly, John 3, 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. God likes you to give to the poor. Likes you to give to those who are in need. He asks us to share our blessings, to bear one another's burdens. So you see, it doesn't really make sense to say, well, this is a call that Jesus says for us to go and be poor. Because if you're poor, then you're closer to God because you're spiritual. It wouldn't make sense for God then to turn around and say, well, no, go give to the poor. Help share the poor. Look, if you got nothing, you got nothing to give. I mean, it, it just, all of that just doesn't make sense. So if this is just like a big giant cloud of confusion to you, okay, don't worry about it, just forget it. Because it doesn't make sense anyway. But if someone comes up to you and says, oh yeah, you know, see, God wants us to be poor, man. God wants us to be poor because of this. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. God doesn't want us to be greedy. But God isn't calling us to be poor. But... On the other hand, he is. But how? What kind of poverty is he asking us here? And when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, I always kind of turn off when pastors start talking about, well, you know, in the Greek it says, because I'm like, hey, buddy, I don't really speak Greek that well, okay? <laughs> Let alone read it. But, you know, it, the, sometimes you do get these neat little insights when you, when you find out, you know, that, that there's certain words that mean certain things. And, you know, when, when God says, blessed are the, when, when, when Jesus opens his mouth and says, blessed are the poor, you know, in, I guess the Greeks, they had a couple words for poor. And one of them was kind of this idea of barely getting by. You know, living paycheck to paycheck. How many here have ever lived paycheck to paycheck? You know, it's like, I'm like, woo -hoo! It's like, that's, that's me, brother, you know. But, you know, bless the poor. But, you know, this word actually isn't that kind of poor. It's not the living paycheck to paycheck. You know, it's not the, you know, like, well... I don't know if we can go to Aspen this year. Maybe we'll wait till next year. You know, it's not that idea of poverty. What this one is, is absolute destitute. You know, because back in the old days, if you were poor, you could always, you know, you got a back, you got legs, you got arms. You could go work someone's fields for a couple turnips and a leak or something like that. And come home like, hey, I got food. You know, you could always do something like that. You know, it's like, you know, the other day I was, well, actually yesterday I was splitting wood all day because I can't afford to make get a new heater. I don't really want to get one because it's our house is all electric, so you know that kind of <laughs> PG and E only gives you so much juice, and once you kind of go beyond that, they kind of start um, becoming quite. Uh, 
liberal with the, the add-ons there. So the penalties, if you will. So, but I'm out splitting wood because that's how I'm going to keep my family warm. I can do that. I got time. Sort of. You know, that's what I, that, but that's what I can do. But this idea, you know, and back then, if you, so if you were poor, you could go out there, you could make something like that. But what if you were crippled and poor? You don't even have the strength to go out there and earn yourself a turnip or a leek. You don't have the strength to go out there to get yourself a yam. You don't have the strength to do anything. You are impoverished, not only monetarily, but physically. You are broken. You cannot work. And so the only and you just thing sit there on a mat, you hold your hand up, and you close your eyes because you don't want to look at anyone in the face because you're that poor. And whatever drops into your hand, that's the mercies that you've received that day. And that's what you can go and give. And God says that is it, that it is that kind of poverty that he wants in your spirit. To be so depleted. To be so empty of what the world holds most dear, and that is self-assurance and self-confidence and the concept of, I, of basically manifest destiny. I can create for myself the future. I can earn my way. I can do it. And what was that, that song by... Um, What's this crazy? I did it my way. You know? God says you need to completely deplete yourself of that thought. See, what's important about this first beatitude and why it separates the Christian from the world is here at the very beginning, the very first thing that Jesus says that you need to do is empty yourself. You need to go to the field of your heart and completely disc it and make it completely void of any natural vegetation that is growing there before I can start planting and I can start filling. This is the first step to becoming the light of the world. If you want the light of the world, or if you want to be the light of Jesus to the world, you must first flush out the darkness that is there. And that is where Jesus begins his Sermon on the Mount. And that's what separates this from all the others. Is This particular beatitude is an emptying, while the others are the result of the graces of God being filled within you. We start to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, this is the first step that sets you apart from the world. You know, as Paul would write to the Philippians in uh, Philippians chapter 3, and, you know, I know we've all read this a million times over, but again, this is important because it, 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 it reaches to and teaches about what it means to empty yourself. And Paul simply says that we are to glory in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, and as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I might gain Christ. Amen. This idea that Jesus, or this teaching that Jesus is saying, this reality is that on a spirit, it's like he's, one, he's drawing us to a spiritual plane. And he's not going to leave it. 
throughout the rest of throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, you must always have this heavenly view of what Jesus is doing. He's calling us up. You must become, you know, impoverished of your own self confidence. You know, it's the, to make your soul cry out the words of John the Baptist. He must increase and I must decrease. Allow yourself to empty and to be filled with God. You know, this, this message perfectly coincides with the gospel of Jesus Christ that we, that we preach. Because first there must be a conviction before there can be a conversion. You must first come to know that you can't do it on your own, that you are filled with sin. That you need the grace of God to cover your sin, to forgive you of your sin. And Jesus says, I want you to be the light, my light to this world. So first, Empty yourself and come to me. And allow, like that, like that beggar in front of the temple, lift your hands up and allow me to start pouring the graces into your palms. Allow me to start pouring my grace into your palms. And what this means for us, what we can take home with this is first off, is yeah, practice, practice this attitude of emptying yourself of your self-confidence that you can do it yourself practice this idea that it doesn't matter you know that 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 how where you were born to whom you were born and how much you have earned and how much you have achieved in life means nothing in meriting the kingdom of God It really means nothing. Now that has a couple effects. One of them is, you know, it kind of helps you when going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people. Because it kind of breaks down the assumptions, the walls, the presuppositions, what you think. It's like, oh, that person doesn't want to hear the gospel. They'll never want to hear it. Well, you know, they might. They just might. And it might surprise you. And also, more importantly, for you, to bring you that point of humility. Knowing that everything you have, you have because of the grace of God. And that leads to the second, to our second point that you get to get home is, don't think do not fall into that trap that because we are still human, we are broken, we are weak. Don't think that just because of that, that you have discounted yourself from the kingdom of God or to be used as a tool by God for his kingdom. Don't fall into that trap. Because, you know, how did you get here in the first place? Did you get here on your own merits? Did you get here by, you know, by working it out yourself? No, you made it into the kingdom of God simply by the graces of God because of your faith in Him. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Therefore, if you struggle... If you are weak, don't disqualify yourself in that thought. Ask for forgiveness and be that light of, that God wants you to be for a desperately needy world. We are coming up on the Christmas season. And right now, you know, people may hate the phrase, Jesus is the reason for the season. There is no time for your lights to shine brighter than now. Meaning family members... And friends, now is a wonderful time for you to bring the light of Jesus there. And it all begins with us emptying ourselves and asking Jesus to fill us with his presence. That we would have confidence in him and his sacrifice. 
And once we take that first step, the rest of the Beatitudes will follow. Once we take that first step of allowing ourselves to be emptied, and we say, Jesus, fill me. Then we truly become Christ's witnesses to the world. With that, let me pray for you. And have a wonderful day. <laughs> Heavenly Father, if we come before you this morning, we just ask, humbly we present ourselves to you. Humbly, with one heart, we cry out. We must decrease and you must increase. Father, prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts for a rich harvest for you. Father, encourage us day by day as we learn your ways that we can show the wonders of your grace to a desperately needy world. Father, we praise you for this upcoming season in that our culture still looks forward to Christmas and the opportunities that we have to share your message with the world, what true joy is. But Father, it all begins here. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. Encourage us and build us up in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.